What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here for a reading of The Ethics of Money Production, written by Jörg Guido Holtzmann and published by the Mises Institute. Today, in Chapter 4 on Utilitarian Considerations on the Production of Money, and Part 7, Monetary Stability. The second most widespread monetary fallacy relates to the problem of monetary stability. The conviction that money should be an anchor of stability in the economic world is very old, but to understand this postulate in a proper way, it is necessary to distinguish two very different meanings of monetary stability. The first meaning stresses the stability of the physical integrity of commodity money. In particular, the physical composition of coins made out of precious metals. Through time, in the sense, monetary stability does not or does have a precise meaning. From a purely formal point of view, it can therefore be possible postulated on ethical monetary policy. It is, a post it is a postulate relating to the production of money. No producer shall make coin bearing the same imprint but containing different quantities of precious metal. Monetary stability in this sense is not just unobjectable, but truly a presupposition of a well-functioning economy. And it is this sense of monetary stability that was stressed in the Bible in authoritative texts of the Middle Ages. The Old Testament is crystally clear on the importance of the physical integrity of coinage. Varying weights, varying measures, are both an ab abomination to the Lord, which is in the Proverbs. Innocent III uh, emphasized the, the same point in the only authoritative uh, papal uh, pronouncement on medieval currency question in the Bull Quanto, Quanto written in 1199. Nicholas Erasmi wrote an entire treatise that exposed the physical alteration of the coinage as a fraudulent and harmful practice. And the other great medieval authority on monetary question, Ptolemy of Lucca, stressed the same point, arguing that the alteration of coinage would work to the people's detriment, since money should be the measurement of things. But the more the money of the money or coinage is changed, the more the value of the weight changes. And this is Ptolemy of Lucha on the government of rulers, uh, on a government of rulers. Notice that monetary stability in the sense of a stable physical integrity of commodity money results in relative stable purchasing power of the monetary unit. When mining is less profitable than other branches of industry, which tends to be the case when the price level is high, then less money will be produced and money prices will tend to decline. And when mining is more profitable, usually when the price level is low, then more money will be produced and money prices will therefore tend to rise. All of this is of no importance whatever to the benefit that can be derived from monetary exchange. It is true that a great decrease of the purchasing power is conceivable when extremely rich and cost-effective new mines are discovered. But nothing, two things. But notice two things. First, in a free economy, the market participants can very easily protect themselves against any unwanted eradication of the purchasing power by simply adopting other monies. Second, as a matter of fact, no such violent depreciation of the purchasing power has ever occurred in the case of precious metals. The famous gold and silver inflation of the 16th and 17th century increased Europe's European stock money stock, according to certain estimates, by not more than 50%, according to others by up to 500%. Around the year 1500, the total stock of money in Europe was about 3,500 tons of gold and 3,750 tons of silver. Over the next 150 years, Spain imported some 181 tons of gold and some 16,000 tons of silver from the mines in South America. Other producers were negligible as compared to these figures.
A major part of the Spanish imports were re-exported to the Far East and the Middle East. See Geoffrey Parker. The Entstehung der modernen Geld- und Finanzwesens in Europa. Uh, the creation of the modern monetary and financial uh, system in Europe from 1500 till 1730. Uh, see also Cicopella and Borchardt, the Europäische Wirtschaftsgeschichte, the European Monetary History, Volume 2, uh, the 16th and 17th uh, century. The authors wrote uh, from F.P. Baudel and Spooner, a uh, prize in Europe, from 1450 to 1750, and they quote from Rich and Wilson in the Cambridge Economic History of Europe. However, this happened over a period of some 150 years. Thus, the average growth rate of the money supply uh, lay somewhere between 0.3 and 3.3% per annum. By contrast, in our days of paper money, even the countries enjoying conservative monetary policy experience far greater increases of the money supply. For example, in the US and in the European Union, the stock of base money, paper notes, plus accounts held at other central banks, have been increased by an annual rate of between 5 and 10% during the past five years. Now let us turn to the second meaning of monetary stability. It, cannot, it connotes the stability of purchasing power of the monetary unit. The first th thinker to formulate this uh, postulate of the stable purchasing power was St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. He argued, and I quote, the particular virtue, virtue of currency must be that a man presents presents it, he immediately receives what he needs. However, it is true that currency also suffers the same as other things. This, that is, does not always obtain for a man what he wants, because it cannot always be equal or of the same value. Nevertheless, it ought to be established that it retains the same value more permanently than other things. And this is St. Thomas Aquinum in his book, Commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics. Notice that St. Thomas realized perfectly well that a stable purchasing power was not a natural outcome of the market process. It was in his eyes an ethical post postulate. However, no major writer before him believed that the stable purchasing power was a meaningful policy objective. Aristotle had observed that prices of all things are in continuous flux and that money was no exception. Uh, see Aristotle in the Nicomachean Nico, Ethics. And that was, uh, that was it. Even after Aquinas, most scholastics sided on the issue with the Greek philosopher rather than with St. Thomas. To the extent that late scholastics, such as Martin Atsipo, Atspilucueta, Thomas de Mercado, Pedro de Valencia, and others stressed a postulate of monetary stability at all. They meant the stable physical composition of coins. Uh, see Marajo Gris Huchenskin in Economic Thought in Spain, uh, and Elmas and Siran. And Appendix, a contemporary historian of economic thought observed that as far as money was concerned, realist and nominalist philosophers paradoxically switched roles. Oresme was the realist philosopher and Aquinas, Aquinas the nominalist. See Andrew Lapidus, Una introduction a la pensée économique medievale. And uh, Byrod and Facciello, Facciarello in Novel Historie de la Panse Economica, and also see Metal, Money, and the Prince, John Burdian and Nicholas Aresmi after Thomas Aquinas, in the history of political economy. Only starting from the 17th century did secular writers, from John Locke to David Ricardo to Irving Fisher, come to endorse a postulate on the stable purchasing power. Today, this, pos this postulate lies at the heart of most contemporary writings on the problem of monetary stability. It is also widely accepted definition amongst contemporary Catholic writers on monetary affairs. Uh, 
See, for example, Oswald von Nell Breuving and Heinz Miller vom Geld und vom Kapital, from the money and capital. However, despite its popularity, it is fraught with ambiguity and is liable to lead to wrong policy conclusions. It is a matter, of course, that the stable purchasing power is a major consideration in the orderly development of the entire economic system. And this is from uh, John the 23rd, the master at Magistra. The question is merely how to balance this consideration with other considerations of a moral and economic nature. On the free market, as we have seen, there is a tendency for the selection of the best monies, including in terms of purchasing power stability. As long as the citizens are free to choose their money, they can avoid exposure to any violent fluctuation of the purchasing power by simply switching to other monies. The question then is whether the stabilization of the purchasing power of money is such an overriding goal that it would justify the establishment of government control over the money supply in order to fine-tune the purchasing power to an extent that would not spontaneously result from the free market process. The ideal of such fine-tuning inspired a great intellectual movement in the early 20th century. Under the leadership of the American economist Irving Fisher and others, this movement paved the way for a complete triumph of paper money. See Irving Fisher, Stabilized Money, A History of the Movement. In practice, the Fisherian stabilization movement was an abject failure. Throughout the entire 20th century, in all countries, the purchasing power of money managed by public authorities declined and oscillated as never before in the entire history of monetary institutions. However, despite this rather devastating empirical record, one could hold that in theory, at least, the case of monetary stabilization is still valid and that it simply needs to be applied much better than in the past. In order to assess this, content, this contention, it is necessary to examine whether, in principle at least, one can fine-tune the purchasing power, and whether such fine-tuning could possibly be warranted in the first place. To this question, we now turn. First of all, notice that the notion of purchasing power of money cannot be given an empirical definition. The purchasing power, in fact, is a total array of things of which a unit of money can be exchanged. It is the price of telephones increases while the price of car drops. It is impossible to say by any empirical standard, impartial standard, whether the purchasing power has increased or decreased. One can, of course, make up such an, some algorithm that weighs the prices of cars and telephones and so on and brings them under a common mathematical expression or index. But such indices are not some sort of constant measuring stick of economic value. For one thing, the, the constitutes of the price index are indeed uh, are in need of in, in, incessant adaption. They need to be changed to take into account the changes in the array of goods and services offered on the market in exchange for money. However, the most important no such index conveys general valid information. Different persons buy different goods. Therefore, some of them might experience a rise of prices, the price they have to pay, while others experience a drop of their prices in the very same period. The quantitative statement of such an index reflects just an average of very different concrete situations, but it, but it is concrete circumstances and not some average that count for human decision making. We cannot do more here than scratch the surface of this technical problem. For details, expose C. Murray Rothbard in Man, Economy and State in Chapter 11. See also Gottfried Turbiner in Der Sinn der Indexzahl, uh, The Sense of Indices. Our point is that, from a purely formal point of view, monetary stability in the sense of a stable purchasing power cannot be easily translated into a clear-cut political postulate. 
the very concept of purchasing power is fraught with ambiguities that can only be overcome by more or less arbitrary decisions of those that charge to apply it. The political implications are momentous. The purchasing power criterion gives great arbitrary power to those charged with making up the algorithm. Now let us assume, for the sake of argument, that the very that these very considerable problems did not exist. Let us assume that monetary stability in the sense of the stable purchasing power could, in fact, be unequivoc unequivoc unequivocally defined. Then the question is, would it be expedient to postulate a stable purchasing power? As we have said, the question is answered affirmatively by the great number of contemporary, contemporary writers on monetary economics. The basic rationale is that of one of the chief function of money is to serve as a standard of value. Businessmen and others use money prices in their economic calculation and to make these calculations as accurate as possible, it is necessary to have a stable standard of value. When is money a stable standard of value? Here we encounter a certain variety of opinions. For example, according to Locke and others, this is the case of the irrational money supply did not change. According to David Ricardo and others, it was the case if the money unit preserved is purchasing power. According to Hayek and others, it was the case that the total amount of money spending did not change. Today, the position exposed by Ricardo is the dominant one. Expect for an important nuance. Ricardo held that gold was the most suitable money, even though, in theory, paper money could have even greater purchasing power stability than gold. He held this position because paper money would open the floodgates for abuses through government. On balance, therefore, Ricardo opted for gold. The yellow metal was an imperfect standard of value, but it was better than any alternative was or promised to be. After Ricardo, however, concerns about tyranny seem to have dwindled in monetary discussion. Most present-day economists have come under the influence of Irving Fisher, who in a lifelong campaign dismissed fears about managed paper monies. Well, guess what? But it does not matter much which of the above definitions we adopt. The basic rationale for a stable standard of value is a spurious one in all cases. See Mises in the theory of money and credit. Uh, in the Geldwertstabilisierung und Konjunkturpolitik, uh, which is the monetary stability and uh, business cycle politics. The nature of business calculation is not the measure of absolute value of the firm's asset, but to compare alternative courses of action. Suppose Jones has a capital of a thousand ounces of silver, Oh, of gold, and that he can use them to either set up a shoe factory or establish a bakery. He expects the shoe factory to yield 1,100 ounces, or 10% gross return, and the bakery to yield 1,200 ounces, or 20% gross return. This comparison is the essence of business calculation. Stability of the purchasing power does not at all come into play. Jones can calculate with equal success under a stable, a growing, or a declining purchasing power. The same thing holds true for deferred payments. His calculus can be exact when the nation's national money supply increases, decreases, or remains frozen. And it can be exact irrespective of whether the total amount of money spending changes or remains the same as before. In light of these considerations, it appears that older writers such as Erasmi were right all along to neglect the stable purchasing power criteria and to keep the attention focused on monetary stability in the sense of the physical integrity of coinage. Piers, thank you very much for joining me on chapter part seven, Monetary Stability of the Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holzmann. Thank you very much. And see you on the next show. Bye-bye.